taking a step back. So DCF, that is your discounted cash flow. And we're actually going to talk a little bit more about it later in the episode, but it's just a valuation methodology where you're trying to figure out what a company is worth based on the cash flows they're spitting out into the future. Now, if you wanted to add up the cash flows that are being generated in the future, those cash flows in the future are not worth as much as the cash flows today. And so you need to Why discount not? them. Well, time value of money, Jen. Time because, value of you know, money. I know. I'm leading the witness. I'm you sorry. are. It's no, but it's good. Because if you are waiting a year or two years or five years or 10 years, A, right, there is inflation. We've just seen record high levels of inflation, but there's also the risk inherent. Like, are you actually going to get those cash flows back? So essentially the money in the future is worth less than today. You could also take that cash if you had it today and you could invest it, right? You could get a return. I mean, today, if you, you were to put it into a treasury- Five and a half percent. percent in like, no, mm -hmm. in like a one month CD. Shoot. Yeah. So the point is that that money in the future is worth less. So you have to discount those cash flows back. And when you're doing a DCF, you discount it using something called the WAC or the weighted average cost of capital. And just for context, like there is obviously a lot that can be said about the WAC. In fact, we have put together a whole series of these like educational videos on TikTok and I think I covered the DCF in one three minute video. It took me three, three to four minute videos to explain the WAC. So just to give you a sense, like there's a lot that goes into this, but in order to calculate the WAC, one of the inputs you need is something called the cost of equity, right? So how expensive is it to fund a business with equity? And again, to get the cost of equity, you need to, you need something called the beta. So one of Jen's favorites, this is the Greek and the beta represents how much something, an asset moves relative to the overall market. So for example, we right, use these Greek mm -hmm. symbols throughout finance to simplify talking about things. But all mm -hmm. I think it ends up doing is it's making complicating it, more it mysterious and mysterious for everyone. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, you're like, oh, the beta of my gamma on this thing is really all about <laughs> the theta. <laughs> okay. So if a company has a beta of 1.5, it means yeah, that- Yeah. What does that mean? The stock price movement, if you have a beta of 1.5, it means that, that if the market benchmark, so say the S&P, if it goes up 1%, the stock will go up 1.5%. If the S&P goes down 1%, you'll go down 1.5%, right? You are riskier than the overall market essentially. And so we use that beta in our WAC calculation. So the next question we need to now get to is how do I find this beta? And there is a divergence between what the academics say you should do and what is actually done in practice. And I'm going to decision Ooh, tree scandal. out. I know. I'm going to decision tree out. Are you doing it in practice on the buy side or on the sell side? Are you doing mm. it for a bank or are you doing it because you're actually trying to value a business and decide if you want to invest in a company? Okay. So let's actually start with the theory, the academic theory. Academic theory says that you should always use a predicted beta. How do you think the company's equity is going to move in the market relative to the market in the future, right? That is go forward because so, you're discounting future cash flows. Yeah. So you want to think mm -hmm. about how, what it's going to be like in the future versus in the past. Exactly. And so in practice, if you wanted to get that predicted beta, there actually is a source for that. There is something called Barra's and they publish these betas. And so you can look up like, what is the beta? B-A-R-R-A-S, right? Nope. No H. Barra. So B-A-R-R-A. So Barra betas. And you often can pull that from like back set, right? You can just get that number. Great. Problem is it's a little Fact bit of a black being, box. Again, just another tool that you'll have at your disposal yeah. at an investment bank. Yeah. So you can just look it up on FactSet. But now I'm going to go to our decision tree. So that's the academic theory. Use a predicted beta. Now here's the problem. So in practice, you have, I'm going to go to the sell side decision tree. So I'm going to, you are the investment banker who maybe has been hired to do a fairness opinion on some company, right? So you are trying to say, what is the value of this business? And it's going to actually go into like an SEC filing um, to support the valuation that is paid in this acquisition, right? You mm -hmm. want to support that Twitter's valuation was like the 4420 or whatever he paid. They had mm -hmm. to, these banks had to put a fairness opinion, went into these filings. Great. What do banks care about? They don't want to get sued. And guess what? I, I saw a stat north of 75% of acquisitions end up in lawsuits. So if you are the bank that is hired to have to justify wait, the your way, assumptions. Sorry. Sorry to interrupt you. I can't wait till we do our episode about bankers versus lawyers. <laughs> I'm really too. excited for that. So if you are the banker, you want to be able to justify your assumptions. You get called up on the stand and it's like, how did you come up with this beta? Or how did you come up with this discount rate? You want to be able to justify it. So the problem with Barra's betas is they're a little bit of a black box. Now, if you apply that black box to everything, okay. I mean, and some banks will choose to use that predictive beta. What a lot of companies prefer is actually to use the past betas, right? Because 
it's factual information. Like anyone can go and they can look at the historical stock price it's much movement more relative to the S&P. In a court of law. Exactly. And so a lot of banks actually will use historical betas. So, how do you get this historical beta? Well, unlike in business school, you don't have to just calculate it using like statistical regressions and all that shit. You go to Bloomberg. Bloomberg is like your best friend. So you go to Bloomberg, you type in the ticker symbol, you hit the beta. Well, actually, I think you have to hit equity first, and then I, I forget my yeah, Bloomberg. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a code. No, no, no. Yeah, you type code. in the ticker symbol, mm-hmm. equity, beta. Yes. Go. So what you're going to get- whole Bloomberg language we'll get into on another episode. Yeah, we're going to need to do a Bloomberg like cheat sheet yeah. thing. I don't remember any of it, but still. <laughs> Too bad neither of us has a Bloomberg. <laughs> I know. Well, there are only what? Details, like hundreds details. of thousands? Only, yeah, yeah, yeah. For actually, the low, I think it low was 28,000 for like the base Bloomberg when we were starting. Just to get like a Bloomberg the anywhere? Base. No, that was not even Bloomberg anywhere. A terminal. Bloomberg anywhere, they charge more for that. So yeah, we can't afford Bloomberg anywhere. Not yet anyway. So the point though, is that you go to Bloomberg, you type in the information and Bloomberg will spit out this, the screen on the screen. It's going to show you a regression of the historical trading prices of the stock against the S and P 500 or SPX, basically using weekly data over a two year period. So on the X axis, it spits out um, essentially how the uh, S and P has moved. And then on the Y axis, it's like, how has your stock moved? And then Bloomberg will apply a trend line to it. And the trend line, right? The slope like if of the you trend remember line. your TI eighty three when <laughs> yeah. you took like A B calculus or whatever right. back in high school, mm-hmm. like it's that. Yes. So the trend line it spits out your slope of the line. That is your beta. That is how much your stock is moving relative to the market as a whole. Here's the thing: how good of a trend line is that? Is this a trend line that is there very little relationship between the movement of the market and your stock? And so that's where R squared comes in. R squared tells us how much of the movement of the stock price is explained by the overall market, right? By the S&P and how much is explained by the independent variable. In our case, the case, the the company itself. The idiosyncrasies of that company that have nothing to do with the movement of the overall market. It's just a a statistical measure of how good a fit your trend line is. Mm -hmm. And so if you have a company that has a very low R squared, it means that the movement of the S&P are not really well explaining the movement of your stock. And so then the question is, great, if they're not really that related, instead of using the company stock, should I maybe look at the company's peers? Should I look at how the movement of the industry- Look at their beta. Look at their beta. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of times you might do that. You might actually look at the beta of the industry. This, by the way, you also would need to do this if you have a private company. Private company, you can't look at the company, how its stock is trading because it's not public. So this is something you would also do with a private company. And so now we get to this idea of an asset beta, which was asked about. So the thing is, is that with a beta, the movement of your stock is, and, and the riskiness, right, or of how much it's moving, it is going to be influenced by leverage. It is influenced by how much debt the company has on it. Adding leverage is adding risk. Mm-hmm. And so- because your peers have debt on them in different amounts than the company you are analyzing, you actually need to unlever those betas. There is a formula for it. You stick the beta that you got from Bloomberg, you stick it into this equation, poof, you have now unlevered your beta. That is called your asset beta. The unlevered beta where you've removed the leverage from the beta, mm-hmm. that is your asset beta. And that is what, if you were to look at the industry, right? If you look at company A, B, C, D, you take the mean or the median, and you get what is the average of your peers. Now, there is one last little wrinkle because guess what? That is the asset beta and your company that you're analyzing probably has debt on it. So there's another equation. You spit that back in and now you relever the beta up to that. The point though is that should you be using the industry average or should you, should you be using the company's beta itself? I mean, if you are a buy side firm and you can kind of do what you want because you're not sitting there trying to fend off like a potential lawsuit, you might say, well, what makes more sense? So yeah, if the R squared's not, if you have a low R squared, yeah, it might make sense to do that. If you have a company that has a short operational history, yeah, it might make more sense to use the industry. So average. that R squared becomes more of a of, of a factor in your decision tree on the buy side because Probably, you're yeah. using it as part of your critical thinking and your analysis. Yes. Versus Whereas on like, the sell side, mm-hmm. and I know where you're heading with this, go ahead. On the sell side, there is a lot more standards that are put in place because you don't want to be accused of manipulating your assumptions. So having so you do the these same are, thing these for are everyone. Yeah. 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 Last little wrinkle, because I do want to make this point. So I made a comment that when you're going to Bloomberg, you take the slope of the the line, right? You take the the trend line, you get the slope. That is something called the raw beta. Now in practice, it's actually more common to use something called the adjusted beta. The adjusted beta is something you can also get from Bloomberg. It'll tell you the raw beta is this and the adjusted beta is 
this other number, you just take that adjusted beta. Technically what it is, is that there was this professor, I think from Morton, who found that over time, the betas of company stocks tend to trend towards one, tend to trend towards the industry average with time. And so there's this calculation where it's like you take two thirds of the raw beta plus one third times one, and that's your adjusted beta. Like that is the mathematical calculation. I'm not like arguing for or against it. I'm just telling you most of the time, most banks will use that adjusted beta. The takeaway Mm -hmm. is that A, how much importance that R squared number has in your calculation depends first on what seat you're sitting in, where you're doing that calculation from. And secondly, regardless of how much that R squared factors into it, if you're working on the sell side, you may just be told, hey, listen, you're using this formula. It doesn't really matter. This is a blunt instrument and it's from a CYA standpoint. And that's why we do it that way. Exactly. All right. Cool. Awesome. That was a great, that was very in-depth, Kristen. Very impressive. (laughs)